Gray Nearing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about flood forecasting at Google and specifically flood forecasting with AI with machine learning at Google and why we're doing this and what what the, you know what we're doing and, and what's come of it. Uh, but first, I'd just like to uh, briefly uh, tell you a little bit about my background so you kind of know where I'm coming from. I think most people here probably have a machine learning AI background, and I do not. So my educational background is in hydrology. I work with water science. I've been doing water modeling for 15 or 20 years. And I came to Google to be sort of a resident hydrologist on the flood forecasting team. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we, uh, we do flood forecasting at Google, about why we're using machine learning to do flood forecasting at Google. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between machine learning and sort of traditional hydrological modeling. And I'm going to take you sort of through the research journey that we've had and tell you a little bit about the outcomes. Please feel free to uh, ask me questions at any point in time. I'd love to hear questions. I'd, I'd be very happy to sort of stop monologuing and, and answer questions, direct some of my comments toward what you're interested in hearing. So feel free to jump in at any time. Thank you very much. OK, so we'll start off explaining why flood forecasting is a challenging problem, why we're in this space, and then I'll tell you, you know, how we address the challenge. So the first, let's see if I can get my slides to work. Small technical issue, there we go, okay. So the, the, the main question that we get a lot on the flood forecasting team at Google is why Google is doing, uh, why is Google, Google is doing flood forecasts? So the answer to the question that was in chat about whether floods, in, I'll talk about what kind of floods we're talking about specifically, uh, but yeah, we do, uh, it is weather related floods. Okay, so why is Google uh, doing flood forecasting? And the reason is because people come to Google for information about floods. We get about a billion people coming to Google search per year asking if it's flooding near them or if it's flooding in a certain location. And then we get a whole bunch of people, maybe another billion-ish people that, that use Google Maps that would benefit from information about flooding uh, when they're getting directions to go somewhere. So people come to Google for information about floods, and we'd like to be able to provide that information to them. This can be uh, easy in some parts of the world where governments have sophisticated uh, flood forecasting agencies that produce alerts that we can scrape and then provide to people. It can be challenging in other parts of the world where flood forecasting agencies maybe don't issue alerts or don't issue timely alerts or don't cover the whole country. So. Our goal really is to provide flood warnings to as much of the world as possible. So why did we choose floods? There's lots of different types of natural disasters that, that affect people. We chose floods as one of our sort of early examples of, of developing AI systems for natural hazards because floods affect more people than any other type of natural disaster. They're the most common type of natural disaster, and they also affect more people than any other type of natural disaster. So this is a graphic from a study conducted by the United Nations Office of Disaster, disaster Risk Reduction in 2015, sort of aggregating statistics over different types of natural hazards over the preceding 20 years, so from 1995 to 2015. And we see that about 50%, a little over half of the natural disasters that occurred during that time period were floods, and it affected somewhere between a quarter and a third of the people on Earth uh, during that time. So we chose floods as a place to start uh, exploring the space of developing AI systems for early warnings. Additionally, there was a study conducted uh, several years ago, almost a decade ago, by the World Bank that that said that developing early warning systems for natural hazards is one of or the most cost-effective uh, way to address, uh, to, uh, to address the problem of climate resilience. They estimated that there's sort of a return on investment of about one to nine, which is very large. And so we thought that if we could find a way to make AI useful in this space, that it would have a large uh, sort of humanitarian return on investment. The main technical challenge with forecasting floods is lack of data. So the way that you traditionally set up a hydrological model to, for, to produce, provide flood forecasts is you take data from a specific location and you calibrate your model in that specific location, and then you use that calibrated model to make predictions. This requires that you have data 
in the same location where you want to make uh, forecasts. So collecting hydrological data, we're talking about setting up a measurement system within a river. Collecting hydrological data is expensive, and it's only about 1% of the watersheds in the world have stream flow gauges. So most places in the world don't have data to calibrate or train uh, hydrological forecast models. And in fact, there is a direct correlation between the lack of data in a particular area or a particular country and the susceptibility of a population in that area to the risks from flooding. This, what you're seeing on the screen, is a, it shows a relationship between GDP in a country and the, the total amount of hydrological data that's available in that country through the United Nations database. And what you can see is there's sort of the higher the GDP, the, you know, the more data is available, and GDP is a really good proxy or a really good indicator of the human, uh, the susceptibility of a population to the human risks from flooding. So the challenge is the places where we need early warning systems, flood warnings the most, the places where the populations are, are, are most susceptible to the risks from flooding, and we're talking about economic and human health risks, we're talking about losing lives and property due to, due to flood events, the places where people are most susceptible to those risks are the same places where it's hardest for us to develop, to calibrate traditional hydro hydrology models to provide accurate flood forecasts. So what do we do? What's the, uh, hold on, yep. So what do we do? Basically, we take all the hydrological data in the world, or at least all of the data that we can take, that we can find in the world. Basically, we're taking all of the open, publicly available stream flow data in the world, and we're training a machine learning model on all of this data. So this is very different than the approach that, that people typically take to providing flood forecasts, where they calibrate a model specifically for one of the points on the map. So you'll take the data from one of the points on the map, which is a point in a river somewhere in the world. You'll take the data from that point, and you'll calibrate a model for that specific location. That's sort of the traditional way of, of calibrating models for, um, for flood forecasting. And what we do is we take all of the data from all of the, over the world and we train one model. The advantage that this has is that the, the AI model that we're training has seen as m many, many more uh, hydrological events under a uh, large diversity of hydrological conditions. And it's able to sort of understand how to interpolate or extrapolate into the space that's into locations that are not shown on this map. So places that are not shown on this map are places without data. These are the places where it's hard to make predictions. And our, our philosophy, our hypothesis is that we can train a model on all the data that's shown on the map and then use that trained model to make predictions in the places that are not shown on the map. I saw a question pop up on the screen. Are we using physics informed machine learning? I have a whole section on that in this talk, but the short answer is no, we're not. Uh, sort of the history of this project, which is several years old now, almost a decade old, is that every time we've added physics to our machine learning models, the quality of the predictions has gotten worse. And we kind of understand the reasons for that. I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, so we're using purely data based predictions. And the reason for that is because pure database modeling provides the highest accuracy that we've been able to find. Okay, so what does the modeling system look like? Basically, we're modeling the rainfall runoff process. That means we're modeling what happens to rainfall when it hits the ground and turns into river flow. So the, the key here, and sort of to address the first question that we got in chat, we're modeling riverine floods. We're modeling floods that are caused by rivers overflowing their banks. This is only one of the types of flooding that exists in the world. Other types of flooding include coastal flooding, where uh, there's some sort of tide or tsunami event that, that floods a coastal area. There's uh, flooding that's caused by direct rainfall. That's where rainfall hits the ground and then causes inundation as it moves toward the river. And then there's riverine flooding, which is caused by rainfall that hits, hits the ground, is collected by a watershed into a uh, stream flow in a river and then the river overflows its banks. And we're looking at, for the purposes of this talk, we're looking only at that third type of flooding, which is where a river overflows its banks. And this really is a, one of the main types of floodings. This is one of the types of floodings that causes the most economic damage. So uh, other types of flooding, uh, coastal flooding is a serious problem. That's a completely different issue, but uh, flooding caused by direct rainfall 
causes road closures, it causes city closures. Uh, it affects uh, the, uh, the developed world a lot, but it is not the kind of flooding that causes the most economic damage in the world. So for the so again, we're talking about the rainfall runoff process, which it means that rain a raindrop comes down from the sky, hits the ground, and makes its way to a river, adds to the volume of water in a river, and then the river overflows its banks. So what kind of information do we need to know in order to model this? We need to have weather information, information about atmospheric conditions. We need to have information about the landscape. We call that hydro, uh, catchment attributes. So we're talking about watersheds or hydrological catchments. So we have uh, geographical, geophysical, geological information about the watersheds themselves, and then we have weather uh, weather forecasts as well. So what kind of data is coming into the model specifically? We take rainfall data from the past. That's daily rainfall data for 365 days in the past. And we take rainfall data for a seven day forecast out into the future. We get our forecast data mostly from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. And we get uh, hindcast weather data, weather data from the past from a combination of ground-based rainfall gauges, satellites. We use the iMERG, IMERG data product from NASA and uh, atmospheric models. So we use a reanalysis model from the ECMWF. And then we take catchment attributes. These are sort of static variables that represent characteristics of the landscape, including uh, geology, vegetation cover, sort of the long-term climate of a, of, a, of a particular area, and then uh, statistics about human influences in a catchment. We feed all this data into a model, and we use it to make predictions of the daily volume of stream flow for seven days into the future. So just to give a sense of, of what our data timelines look like, we use data going back to 1980 to train the model. Some of that data stops, we are not, it doesn't exist in real time, and we have to sort of switch to other data products to use in real time, and we use some sort of masking procedure to be able to transition from these data products that have long uh, data records in the past that we can use for training the model. And we're talking about input data now, not necessarily the target data, which is the target data is stream flow data like we talked about earlier, but the input data, we, you know, some products exist long into the past we can use for training, and some of the data products that we need exist for sort of short time spans into the past, and then but they exist in real time, so we can use them to make real time forecasts. And so we have to use some sort of imputing strategy where we take, for example, uh, ERA five data, which is a data product from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. We train on that, and then we use this sort of ECMWF HRES, which is the the real time weather forecasts that are produced in uh, global weather forecasts produced by by Europe, the science agency in Europe called Copernicus uh, produces these forecasts. So we have to use some sort of imputing strategy so that we can train on one type of data and predict on another. That's not something we're gonna talk about now. That's just sort of a trick we, we use. Uh, basically we use a, a self-attention layers to do that imputing, but we'll not talk about that today. The model that we're using is based on a long short-term memory network, which, uh, usually comes as a surprise because people have mostly transitions away from using LSTMs, but we use LSTMs for this. Our, we use an LSTM-based model. I'll get into some of the details in a minute, but we use this model because it's the most accurate model that we found. We've tried all different types of models, including attention networks and, and um, different learning strategies, including neural ODEs, um, including physics-based machine learning and none of them work as well as the LSTM. So why does the LSTM work well for this problem? It's because the LSTM acts like the system that we're trying to model. There's a strong conceptual bias. The LSTM is a Markovian model, meaning that it keeps track, of, it, it estimates a state space and time. It keeps track of that state space and it uses that, the value of the state vector, the cell state in the LSTM. At any given time step, it, it uses the cell state value plus the inputs from that time step to make predictions. And the way that a watershed works is that there's some, or any physical system works this way, there's some state of the system at any given current point in time. Then there's some boundary uh, variables in that system, some fluxes of mass and energy into and out of the system. And all that you need to know in order to predict the evolution of a physical system is the current state and the future boundary conditions. And that tell, that's 
everything you need to know about uh, about the system in order to predict its future behavior. It's exactly the same way that an LSTM works, and so there's a strong synergy between the way that the LSTM models uh, systems and the way that these systems actually operate. Sort of to say this in the language that a hydrologist would understand, uh, watersheds are state, uh, state-based systems and LSTMs are state-based models. Okay, so how we apply the model individually per watershed. So what you're seeing on the left here is, is what a watershed looks like. This is some area over the landscape. It's divided up into smaller parts and there's a little dot there that represents a stream flow gauge. And what we're trying to do is we try to model, we apply this LSTM based model to an entire area of land that represents the, the area of land that catches rainfall that eventually drains to a specific location in the river. That's a watershed. So we, we apply the LSTM based model to the entire drainage area for a specific point on the river. This is called lumped catchment modeling, it means that we might model two separate places on a river that are maybe apart, uh, separated by a few kilometers or a few tens of kilometers uh, separation along a river channel. And most of the drainage area for those two locations on the same river will contain the same uh, area of land. There'll be a large overlap in the drainage areas between two locations on a river. And we'll apply the model separately to those locations. So what we do is we cut out sort of, we estimate the total rainfall in that total in the total drainage area and then we use that to predict one location on the river and then independently we'll cut out the rainfall uh, for the drainage area of a location down slightly downstream from there and then we'll use that to predict downstream there's no explicit connection between locations in the river we don't use a routing model we don't try to model the way that the water flows through the river we just model the way that rainfall turns into stream flow at any particular point in the river Okay, so this is what our model architecture looks like. Actually, this is this architecture is is a little bit old. So the uh, at the end of this lecture, I'm going to talk about I'm going to show you where you can get our predictions in real time. And this is not the model that's currently being shown on our Google Flood Hub, but this is the model that we uh, used for the most recent publication, scientific publication. So this is the one that I'll talk about today. The basically this model uses two LSTM networks that run over a time series of input data, the dark blue and the light blue networks. Each box is a cell, is one particular cell of the LSTM, so one particular time step of the LSTM. The blue, the blue, dark blue LSTM on the left is running over the past up until today. So the issue time of a forecast is today. We're going to issue a forecast today, and we're going to tell you the expected stream flow for the next seven days into the future. Those seven days in the future are the light blue LSTM on the right, running over seven time steps. Basically, what happens is we run the model over the hindcast model over the past data, 365 days in the past up until today, using weather data from the past, again from satellites, models, and in situ stream uh, rain gauges. The cell state and the hidden state from the LSTM are then passed off to this forecast LSTM, which is the light blue that is initialized from the cell state hidden state of the, pre, of the hindcast LSTM and then runs seven days in the future. The reason we split this, this is an, so it's, it's basically an encoder decoder LSTM. And the reason that we split this up into this encoder and decoder is that the weather data from the past looks very different than the weather forecast from the future. You can think about weather data from the past being drawn from a different uncertainty distribution than weather data from the future. Basically, we can look at the past and we have a pretty good idea of what weather really was, but weather forecasts have high uncertainty. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to sort of merge these into a single time series where you have past weather data transitioning into future weather forecasts and feed them into the same model because that model won't understand how to deal with this change in uncertainty distribution from the, from the past to the future. So we use this encoder decoder structure and we take the seven day forecast from the decoder LSTM the, the running over the seven days into the future. And that model is receiving weather forecast from these seven days into the future. OK, so what is the how well does the model do? What does it look like? Basically, uh, what I'm going to tell you about over the next few slides come from this paper we had published uh, last month, March, published in March in Nature, where we compared this model with the uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, GLOFAST system. So there are several ways that flood forecasts are currently made. 
many most countries in the world have uh, a flood forecasting agency that produces flood forecasts for their uh, country specifically. And then there are also sort of these, these institutions that produce global flood forecasts. The ECMWF is probably the main institution. They've been producing global flood forecasts for about 20 years, so longer than anybody else in the world. And the system that they use, the modeling system they use to produce a global flood forecast is called GLOFAST, the Global Flood Awareness System. And so what we did is we took our model, this AI model, that I, the machine learning model that I just described, and we compared it against this GLOFAST system over the past, um, what is it, eight years since 2014 through uh, 2022. So we, we used evaluation data from 2014 to 2022. The reason we picked that time period for evaluation is that the uh, we have weather forecasts that come from a model that's more or less consistent going back to 2014. There was a big model, uh, model shift in 2014, meaning there's a big change in the model that was used to make weather forecasts in 2014 at CMWF, we use that as input data, so we didn't try to evaluate anything before 2014. So this is the basic story, the basic outcome from that model comparison. What you're seeing on the top plot here are the locations that we have streamflow data to, to make a comparison. So we have to compare against observed data to understand how well the model's doing. So these are the locations that we're we're doing evaluation in the top panel. You'll notice that it's kind of similar to the location, the, the map that I showed earlier about where streamflow data is available. That's sort of a, a tautology, truism. Um, but what's interesting here is that every one of these locations, we trained a model that makes predictions at that location out of sample. So we used a K-fold cross-validation split to split up the training data. So we train on nine-tenths of the data and then uh, locations and then predict on 10 uh, percent of the locations that were not used during training. So every sort of statistic, every result that I'm going to talk about here are results that are out of sample from the training data set in location. So the models have never seen data from the locations where they're going to be used to make predictions. That's true for the machine learning models, but it is not true for GLOFAS. The GLOFAS model is generally calibrated in not all of these locations, but in uh, about two-thirds of the locations. So in this comparison between GLOFAST and the machine learning model, it's sort of a biased comparison that, that favors GLOFAST because GLOFAST has seen the data in those locations before. And in fact, GLOFAST has actually been trained, calibrated on the same data that we're using for evaluation. It's not a clean uh, CalVal split for, for GLOFAST. For the AI model, it's a clean trained test split. Not only has the model never seen data from the exact data used for training, it's never seen data from the location where it was, uh, where it's used to make predictions. So on the bottom plot, the, the machine learning model is in orange and GLOFAST is in blue. The seven time steps, the seven, the zero through seven on the X axis are the four, four uh, lead times. So zero day lead time that's predicting stream flow today, all the way up to seven day lead time that's predicting seven days in the future. And then GLOFAST doesn't archive, the newest version of GLOFAST doesn't archive their predictions, they only archive their now casts. So we're only able to benchmark against their predictions made today about today. And uh, what the metric that we're using here is the F1 score, which is the mean, the harmonic mean of precision and recall over two year return period events. So these are uh, events, these are stream flow values that are expected to happen on average once every two years. And a two-year return period event is generally where a global flood forecast system will issue a warning. We usually issue warnings at over two-year return period events, and we issue danger levels over uh, uh, over five or ten-year uh, return period events. Usually, ten-year return period events. So, what we're looking here is what we what we would generally consider to be a warning level, sort of like watch out. There could be a flood coming. This is the first uh, sort of the first level where we would in any case, offer an alert to users. Uh, and we're looking at the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. In our case, precision and recall are generally the same almost everywhere, so we didn't feel the need to split up the graphs into both precision and recall. They're very, very close to each other. So the F1 score can be interpreted as either precision and recall. And what we see is that we get uh, 
average, the, the box plots are distributions over the uh, several thousand, two thousand locations that are shown on the top. And what we see is that we get precision and recalls that are at about a five day lead time that are similar to GLOFAS uh, nowcast. So we're able to extend the current accuracy of the global flood awareness system out about five days into the future. We're, we're able to give about five extra days of warning with the same accuracy that GLOFAS has now. And again, this is GLOFAS calibrated mostly two thirds of the time calibrated in the locations where it's used to make predictions versus the machine learning model that's never seen data from these locations before. Okay, and the, the other important statistic here is that we're able to predict more extreme floods with similar accuracy to GLOFAS predicting less extreme floods. So we're able to predict five year return period events with statistic that with statistical uh, accuracy that is not statistically different than GLOFAS one year return period events. So generally it's harder to predict larger floods. And so we're able to predict, you know, extend the current GLOFAS accuracy from one year events to about five year events. That's sort of the way to think about this. So we're able to predict larger floods further in advance. And these uh, deltas are, are meaningful. So five-year events are somewhere between warning and danger levels. And uh, five days extra lead time means that people have uh, time to act. It's harder to predict larger floods for two reasons. One is because they're more rare. So even when you're calibrating a physically-based hydrology model, you, these rare events have less influence on, on this calibration process. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is that it's um, there's a complex mix, mix of physical processes that go into creating a flood. There has to be the right antecedent condition. So the, generally the area has to be wet already. There has to be a long history of rainfall. And then there has to be uh, enough rainfall at the, at the moment of the flood to actually cause a flood. That's true for sort of humid areas. In arid areas, the situation is different. There's, it's even more complex, sometimes really, really dry soil uh, forms a seal over the top. So if the, the area is really dry and you have any rainfall, then that, that can turn into a, a flood event. And so it's very difficult to build models that are able to understand these uh, physical processes and then to calibrate those models accurately, especially when the events that, you're worried, that you care about predicting are rare in the training record. And one of the things that uh, uh, machine learning can help with is, is because it you sees data because it's trained on data from all over the world it has a larger set of experiences drawn there are more extreme events to train the model on and the challenge for the machine learning model is to understand how those extreme events the the causal processes for those events or the input data for those events changes from location to location uh, we did look at low uh, stream flow but that's not the purpose of our project here which is providing flood warnings uh, there's a whole bunch of research papers that i'll show you here in just a minute and all of those research papers, I think, except for this one that we're looking at, provide statistics for low flow. Uh, usually low, uh, modeling low flows is useful for understanding uh, sort of environmental stressors, water resource applications. Okay, let's see. So um, what we see here on this chart at the top are places in green where the machine learning model performs better and places in red where the GLOFAST model performs better. There, about 80% of the dots on the screen are green and about 20% of the dots on the screen are red. So there are places in the world where the GLOFAST model outperforms the machine learning model and it would be useful to be able to predict where that happens because if you can predict where that happens, you can use one model in those locations or locations that are similar to that, and you can use another model in, in the place, you know, you can use the models where they perform better. The problem is that in general, we found it's impossible to predict where one model would perform better than the other. To us, this looks like random noise. The way that we tried to do this is we tried to take the geophysical, geographical, and geological catchment attributes, the, the data that describes a particular location, the characteristics of a particular location, and we put those into some sort of random forest model, some sort of classifier model to predict which, mo which of these models, the machine learning model or GLOFAST, will perform better in that particular type of location. And we played all kinds of games because, you know, the, the, there's sort of an 80-20 split on, on the training data, 80% of the time the AI model works better, 20% of the time GLOFAST works better, so we have to play some games with this imbalanced training data set, 
but really no matter what we do uh, the model's not we're not able the classifier is not able to differentiate where uh, Glowfast will perform better than the AI model and the reason for that is that both models kind of perform better or worse for the same reason so generally it's harder to predict in arid catchments than human catchments generally it's harder to predict in larger catchments than smaller catchments um, so what we can do is we can predict where either model will perform above average or below average this is a this we can train classifiers that predict where on earth what kind of watersheds we can expect to prov to have above average or below average uh, skill predictions and we can make a map of what we expect the skill to be over the whole world so this is the f1 score over two-year return periods that we expect to get from a model everywhere in the world we don't have data to evaluate this but this is what our classifier or this is what our, our skill regression model tells us we should expect based on the attributes of watersheds in that particular area and what you can kind of see here is that the that it's harder to make accurate predictions in arid places that are more arid. So the future work should go into understanding how to make predictions in arid catchments. We've done a little bit of work here, dividing the, the world's uh, hydrological data up into arid and humid, and then training models for the arid locations. But in general, we've never been able to beat just training one model over all the data in the world and applying it everywhere in the world. Uh, this is some uh, you know, ongoing research that we have in collaboration with a few universities. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through, I'm going to spend about uh, eight, eight to 12 more minutes taking you through some of the interesting science questions that we encountered along the way to get to where we are today. And at the very end, I'm going to show you where you can go to get our forecasts in real time. Um, just to give a little background here, we've been publishing sort of the background research supporting papers for this project since about 2018. And we've, we've looked at a lot of sort of the tangential problems related to, flood, to, to hydrological prediction in general and flood forecasting specifically. So I'm sure that uh, you can get these slides if you want, or you can look, look us up on Google Scholar, but we've looked at ways to quantify uncertainty. We've looked at ways to reduce the time scales uh, to shorter than daily. Uh, we've looked at ways to use multiple uh, different types of forcing data. Data simulation means taking real-time data and plugging it into the model in real time. So some places collect streamflow data in real time, and they're able to get us that streamflow data in a timely manner. And the question is how to use that data in a, in a model as we're making predictions. That, uh, that's called data simulation. And then we looked at physics-informed machine learning and some other things. I'm going to take you through just a couple of the more interesting sort of aspects of, of refining these models here, and then at the, we'll talk a little bit about physics and form machine learning at the end. Okay, so the, the most common question that we get from hydrologists is, how does a machine learning model or a data-driven model work on extreme events? The idea is that extreme events are rare in the data set, and if you train a model, if, you, if your model relies completely on training to historical observation data, and the events that you care about are rare in that data set, is the model able to sort of faithfully reproduce extreme events? And so this is one of the first things we looked at. This is critical for flood forecasting. It's also critical from a science perspective, especially developing trust in AI in the hydrological sciences and operations community. This is sort of the main concern that we hear most often. So we conducted a study where we divided the data up, we took all of the stream, we took a whole bunch of stream flow data from the United States, 531 watersheds in the United States, and we divided all of that stream flow data up into return periods. So a return period, it means the highest, it, a return period is calculated on the highest stream flow event in a given year. So when you have a one year return period year, that means that the highest flow, stream flow value in that year is expected to occur on average once per year. If you have a five year return period year, that means that the highest stream flow event during that year of data is expected to occur on average once every five years. So what we did is we took 40 years of stream flow data from 531 watersheds in the United States, and we divided 
this data up into years of hydrological data based on return period. We trained on all of the years of data with return periods between one and five years, so sort of the smallest events. And then we used the model to predict years of data with five to 100 plus return period years, so much larger events. What you're seeing on the y-axis is the absolute percent error in, in estimating the flow of the largest event in a particular year. So lower is better, that mean lower means a lower error, higher is worse, higher means a worse error, and what we're doing here is we're comparing several models. The LSTM model is in blue, that's the machine learning model that we've been talking about. The green model is the Sacramento Soil Moisture Accounting Model, which is the model that's used operationally to produce flood forecasts in the United States. And then the gray model is the National Water Model, which is also developed by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Weather Service in the United States, but it's not used operationally. It's run, but it's not the model that will give us flood forecasts. If you live in the United States, you've probably gotten a flood warning pushed to your cell phone. That comes from the green model here. So one to five year return period events are the most common events. 100 plus return period events, 100 year plus are the least common events, the most rare events. Larger events are more rare. 100 year events are larger and more rare. They're expected to occur on average once every 100 years. One year return period events are smaller and more common. They're expected to recur, uh, occur uh, on average once every year. So what we see here is that if you compare the blue model and the green model, we lose all models lose accuracy as you predict higher, uh, more extreme events. But the green model, the, the model, the Sacramento Soil Moisture Accounting Model, which again is the model that's used operationally for flood forecasting in the United States, loses accuracy faster. It loses more accuracy than the machine learning model. The National Water Model is in gray, a dotted line. It loses accuracy not as fast, it loses less accuracy, but the difference is that the national water model is actually calibrated on data that includes 100-year return period events. It includes all the events in the database. So the, the blue model, the machine learning model, LSTM, and the green model, the Sacramento model that's used operationally, are calibrated here in this case only over one to five-year return period events, so the more common events and then they're used out of, to make out of sample predictions for these larger stream flow events. The gray model is impossible to recalibrate. It's too big, it's too unwieldy to recalibrate. So it can only be, it was calibrated once by the National Center for Atmospheric Research and then it's just frozen, left alone, and it's calibrated on basically all the data. So it's not a straightforward comparison. You can still see though that it has larger errors than the machine learning models over larger events. So what we're showing here is that while it is true that it is harder to predict uh, larger uh, events, that the machine learning models lose less accuracy as the event size grows in general. Okay, and the last thing that I wanna talk about is, um, is physics-informed machine learning. This is probably the second most common question that we get, especially when we go to earth science conferences where people are used to working with physics models, used to reasoning about the world in, in, in physical terms and not in data, uh, not in database terms. So there's a little bit of apprehension about machine learning in the physical sciences. There's a question about whether machine learning will produce physically realistic results, whether these results can be trusted, especially out of sample. And that's really important for flood forecasting. So one of the first things that we tried several years ago was putting some physics into the LSTM model. The most basic piece of physics that hydrologists use to model the rainfall runoff process is mass conservation. The idea is that every drop of rain that goes into a watershed needs to go somewhere. Water can't be created or destroyed. So every piece of rain, all of the rainfall needs to be accounted for. It can either go to groundwater it can go to evaporation, it can go to transpiration, which is water used by plants, or it can go to the stream flow. It can go to stream flow. And the idea is that if you, somehow you need to enforce mass conservation into these machine learning models, and that way, no matter what happens within the model, whatever rain you get from the atmosphere will turn into stream flow. The hypothesis is 
that this will produce better stream flow predictions because you're not, you know, magically losing water or magically gaining water. So the way that we added a mass balance constraint to the LSTM is that we took every gate of the LSTM and we normalized it. So there's a cell state in the LSTM, that's X in this graph. This is one time step of an LSTM. The, cell, the state at the previous time step, X of T minus one, goes into the LSTM. It's modified by some uh, positive, some addition operator and some multiplication operator and it comes out at time step t as the state of the system at time step t to be fed into the model at the next time step. So if that state represented somehow the amount of water that was in a watershed, then we could, in principle, we could uh, force the LSTM to conserve mass. Basically, the way that we're gonna do this is that every time we add to the cell state, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add an amount of information to the cell state that that has physical units that represents the actual amount of water coming into the system at a particular point in time. And I'm not going to go through all of the math involved in this. It's actually a very simple operation, but you can kind of see this if you think about a single feed forward layer in a neural network. If you feed in variables to a single feed forward layer into a neural network, and then the feed forward layer has, let's say, five nodes, you'll get five values that come out of that feed forward network. If the feedforward network has an activation function like a sigmoid or a hyperbolic tangent, you'll get five values that are range between zero and one or range between negative and one and one, five bounded values. What you can do is you can normalize those values. We can imagine taking L1 norm or an L2 norm so that the sum of those values coming out of uh, any layer in your neural, neural network is exactly one. And then you can multiply by the quantity you wanna conserve. So in this case, if we wanna conserve rainfall through some deep network at every layer in that network will normalize all the values of the nodes in that layer and will multiply by the quantity we want to conserve that means that every every feature every feature layer in the neural in a deep learning neural network is associated with physical units and we can track those units through the model so we can play this game all the way through the LSTM, and I'm gonna gloss over the details a little bit because it's it's kind of too much to conceptualize in a short talk like this, but we can play this game throughout the LSTM. We have a little theorem that shows that the LSTM is obeys a symmetry property that's equivalent to mass conservation, and so we can conserve mass in an LSTM this way. Notice that this is physics-informed machine learning done by actual symmetry in the machine learning models. It's not done by regularizing a loss function. It's not done by making sure, by, by penalizing models that lose water or gain water. It's done by actually forcing symmetries, conservation symmetries into the architecture of the models. There's nothing that the model can do to ever violate that. It's just purely within the mathematical structure of the model. We can train this model and we can see sort of how well it does. And what we see is that it loses about 5% accuracy. So adding mass conservation to the model actually makes the model slightly worse. What you're looking at here is just some representation of skill score. It's NSE is an R squared value. Higher R squared values are better. So being further to the right on the plot is better. The Y axis on the plot is the fraction of the 531 watersheds in the United States that you score a particular skill score. So what you want to be, you, so models that are better, they're further, they have higher R squared values, they're further to the right. Traditional hydrology models here, a whole bunch of them are shown in dotted lines. The machine learning models are the gold lines to the right. And the mask, the, the LSTM is the furthest to the right, and the mass conserving LSTM is the one with diamonds on it. So we lose a small amount of skill, and I'm going to go through, uh, the, basically, the reason why we lose that skill is because the rainfall estimates, which is the amount of water that we're trying to conserve, are not perfect. Yeah, so because the rainfall estimates are not perfect, if we force the model to conserve, uh, to obey mass conservation, it's conserving the wrong amount of water, so the wrong amount of stream flow comes out. And we can kind of see that in action. So here we have uh, two maps representing bias in two different precipitation products. One precipitation estimate has a strong positive bias in the Eastern United States and no significant bias in the Western United States. 
and one of the precipitation products has no significant bias, geographical bias at all. We can train a physics-based machine learning that obeys mass conservation on these two different precipitation products. We, so this is a physics-based model, and we can measure the bias in the stream flow predictions by these models. And we can see that the model that's calibrated to the biased rainfall data produces biased results. So what we're actually seeing on this chart is the bias in a model that's calibrated to a particular rainfall product. So what happens is these physically-based models that obey mass conservation, they can't be trained to deal with the bias in the rainfall products because they're forced to conserve mass. So what we're seeing is the bias in the rainfall product is preserved as a bias in the stream flow estimates when you use a physics-based model. But when we use a machine learning model with the same rainfall products, it learns to compensate for this bias. And again, this is one model trained over the entire United States, and it learns how to compensate for this bias in sort of geographically heterogeneous ways. So it doesn't do the same thing in the eastern United States in, let's say, Mississippi, as it does in the western United States, say, Oregon. It's learning to do something different to compensate for rainfall biases differently in different locations. This bias compensation, this sort of ability to learn biases and geographical biases in the input products is a huge benefit and it allows us to get this sort of extra 5% skill score in the accuracy of the predictions. Okay, so I'm gonna spend one minute, the last minute here talking about the flood hub. You can get our forecasts in real time at g.co forward slash flood hub. These, you can go to this right now and you can see uh, this map, a map that looks something like this. The colored locations are places where we make forecasts. Green means that we don't think anything significant is happening. Yellow and red means that we think there's potential for flood. Yellow is that two-year return period warning level. Red is that 10-year return period danger level. And you can zoom in on any of these locations. A red pin here in uh, California, as it turns out, this is a few weeks old, so this is not happening right now. But you can zoom into one of these red pins and see what we think the, for the stream flow forecast will look like for the next seven days, that's the plot on the right, and see how we think the flood will increase or decrease over the next seven days. You can go there and check this out anytime you want. Uh, we're currently uh, developing an API. It's in its beta re or alpha release right now, where you'll be able to actually query this data. But again, that's in alpha release, so it's not publicly available yet. Anyway, thank you for your attention and take questions. Um, I don't see. Yeah, there are some questions in the chat popping. Cool. Let's see if I can see them. Uh, I can read them if you would prefer. Okay. Yeah, I got them on the screen. Do you mind if I just dive in? Yeah, go ahead. Perfect. Okay, so the I'm reading them from the bottom to the top because that's the way they show here. So are the forecasts only from the LSTM or do we include local flood forecasting center warnings? On Flood Hub, they're only from the LSTM. So this is a big uh, question in our group right now. We would love to include warnings from other agencies. The technical challenge there is that uh, uh, it takes bespoke engineering capacity to bring in warnings from basically every agency in the world. So if you imagine every country has a flood forecasting agency, sometimes different states have flood forecasting agencies. Um, and it's hard for us, and all of that data, all of those warnings and data, there's no consistent format that these uh, agencies use. There's no consistent sort of data access pipeline. We've worked with five countries in the past to get data, share data with them, get, get uh, real-time data from them, and also get real-time forecasts from them. And each one of those countries takes a huge amount of engineering effort to set that up. So what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to work with the World Meteorological Organization to standardize this process. This is part of the United Nations Early, for, Early Warnings for All initiative. If we can standardize some of this uh, warning process that, and, and have the government warnings standardized in some way, then we could bring those in uh, in a realistic way. As it, as it sits, it would take us several dozen engineers to bring in uh, warnings from different countries. So we're not doing that right now. So now that we, the next question is, now that we don't use physics-informed machine learning, do we check for conservation of max at prediction as an extra check? The answer is yes, and we have a paper on that. 
uh, I forget the title, the name of that paper off the top of my head it's here. So one of these two bullet points, if you want to take a screenshot of this, one of these two bullet points, it's the uh, on strictly enforced mass conservation constraints for modeling the rainfall runoff process. That paper will have our checks on the uh, stream flow biases. And again, the machine learning models have lower bias, uh, it, total bias, which is a proxy for mass conservation, have low, lower total bias than any of the physics-based models. And the reason for that, again, is that they're conserving, the physics-based models are conserving mass on sort of erroneous rainfall input data. Uh, let's see. I think, I think that's all the questions, uh, the, the ones you, you answered before. <coughs> if that's okay, there is one question from me. So you talked about the bias in the, uh, how the model was taking care of the bias. So how interpret interpretable the, the uh, LSTM is right now? That's a fantastic question. And so there's sort of two, I, in my mind, this is how I view interpretability of machine learning models, which is probably very naive. Again, my background is not in machine learning. So I sort of see two levels of interpretability. One are the typical things like sensitivity analyses. So for example, integrated gradients, right? We can use integrated gradients to understand how the model responds to different types of inputs, which input it's listening to the most, under which conditions, which input it's listening to less, you know, what it's doing with different types of inputs. And uh, we've done that. So many of the papers that were listed earlier have some sort of integrated gradient analysis that's relevant to that whatever specific question that paper is asking. Here's an example where we used integrated gradients to understand how the model listens to three different precipitation products. So orange, blue, and green are three different estimates of precipitation from three different precipitation, real-time precipitation products. And this is the what you're seeing colored on the map is the indication of the precipitation product that has the strongest integrated gradient. So the product that the model's listening to the most over the whole hydrograph, over just the, when it's raining, which is the rising limb, or just when it's not raining, which is the falling limb. And then the rows are how many days back in the past. And you can see that the model listens to learns to listen to different precipitation products in different amounts over different areas and during different uh, hydrological sort of regimes, rising or falling. So we can play games like this and kind of understand what the model's doing as it as it relates to using different inputs. Um, but there's sort of a second level of explainability in some of these that, that people sometimes think about, especially when we're using machine learning to model physical systems. And that level of explainability kind of limits to, can we learn new physical laws from machine learning models? And we're not doing that here. So we're not learning new physics. We've, we've never been able to extract new hydrological knowledge from these models. When we look at them, they're behaving the way that we expect based on what hydrologists know about how watersheds work. But I wouldn't say that we're, we've learned anything new about watershed behavior or watershed physics from training these models. Um, there is a strong argument, and we have a paper about this, that there is something new to learn. These models are learning patterns that hydrologists don't know or at least haven't been able to encode into the physics-based models. We kind of know that because they're learning consistency that other models don't have. But what we're not able to do is translate that into new hydrological theory. That is very interesting and cool. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Please feel free to ask them. There is one question in the chat. It's, it's almost all uh, computer science software engineers. We have a couple people that are hydrologists on the team. Uh, two of us, myself, my PhD is in hydrology, and then my colleague has a bachelor's, maybe master's in water science, but then his PhD was in machine learning. And then most of the people on the team are software engineers. And I would say, just to add a little color commentary to that question, my personal opinion is that uh, teams are most effective with a lot of software engineers. A lot of the work is, and a lot of the interesting work is software engineering and machine learning. And I've been involved in a lot of these cross-disciplinary uh, domain science machine learning groups. And in my experience, the groups that tend to have the most impact and tend to build the best uh, systems and models and, and solutions to problems are ones that really have a core of expertise in software development 
and machine learning, and then bring in domain experts as advisors. Another kind of group is where the group is centered around the domain, uh, a, a domain science lab, and then brings in machine learning experts or brings in software engineers. My experience is that that's slightly less effective. Again, this is all personal experience, but that's slightly less effective because uh, the data, most of the day-to-day -day problems that you're going to uh, tackle are software engineering problems, and you really need that core uh, body of expertise there. It's much easier to bring domain knowledge into a software engineering problem than it is to try to apply software engineering as sort of a band-aid over a domain science problem. That's my personal opinion. If we have time for one more question, I think somebody raised their hand. Just ask live. Yeah, do you want to just ask your question live? Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Gray, uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I've read about your paper on uncertainty and in which you propose um, Gaussian mixture models and other ones such as the CML, uh, which are Laplacians, I mean, I think. And well, my, my question is, in the previous, in previous years, uh, on based, based on uh, conceptual models, um, these models are being assessed not only uh, with the uncertainty, but they also apply something called the latent hypercube uh, for assessing this uncertainty. And I would like to know if you, uh, why did you, didn't you uh, measure this, something that is called the, the 95 PPU, which is the amount of data that is between this 95 of this 95 percent of distribution uh, something like good of fitness uh, is it necessary for to 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 do it why didn't you measure that amount of data ob observe that amount of observations that fall between the, the range this 95 percent range uh, of your results of these um, measures? Yeah, that's a great question. Th thank you so much for the question. It's a great question. The answer is we actually did do that. So that's kind of shown on this plot. It's not exactly the measure you're talking about, but this plot shows that same measure broken down into all of the deciles of the distribution. So not five to 95%, but for example, 40% to 50%, 50% to 60%, and so on. And so it provides kind of a finer grain resolution to the kind of statistical metric that you're talking about. So this is a QQ plot is what it's called. And the goal is to for your model to be along the one-to-one -one line. What that means is that 50% of your observations fall within 50, uh, the 50th percentile on your uh, cumulative density function. And if that's true for the whole distribution, then that means your model's well calibrated. So the closer you are to the one-to-one -one line, the, the better you are against that kind of metric. But again, we're looking at it a little bit more fine-grained, every decile instead of the just the whole 5 to 95 percentile. And this plot, which is in that paper, by the way, is why we chose CMOL over Gaussian mixture models, because it's slightly better, able to slightly better calibrate. And uh, the reason why that's true is in the paper, but it's basically because CMOL uses an asymmetric distribution and the uncertainty in hydrological data is asymmetric. It has heavy tails. Okay, but this will, will depend on the, the kind of geography that is that you are studying, I mean. That is absolutely true. And I just would, uh, I don't have those plots, but we broke some of those down in the paper, just a couple. Also, all the data from that paper is available. So, if you want to look at the geog uh, the geograph the distributions for a different geography, it is available on Zenodo. Yeah, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Like, if you want to look at that and you want to reach out by email, I'd be more than happy to sort of walk through that data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you everyone for asking questions. I think we're now. Um, towards the end, it's been an hour. Thank you, Gray, very much for presenting and answering all the questions. It's been
really interesting and engaging. Um, yeah, so we will end here. And our, the recording also will be available on uh, our Cohere YouTube channel in a few days, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.